Welcome to Never Shut Up. It's your boy, Marcel Swally. It's my day. Yeah, baby, it's Friday. We're going camping, too. Oh, taking some itty-bitties and meeting some itty-bitties. So you know what that means. Support the itty-bitties. <laughs> ProjectTransition.org. Make sure you log on there. I will send you this book. Somebody just he emailed me, say, hey, man, ready for my book? I said, that donation clear. Let's go. So make sure you're on that team. All right, Ryan Clark, my guy. Mm -hmm. Talking about Caleb Williams, my guy. Uh, saw Caleb Williams not too long ago. A lot of conversation about Caleb Williams. One, because he's the projected number one overall pick. So you know what happens, especially when you come into your last year in college, already expected to go number one. All they do is pick you apart. All they do is talk about the negatives, right? Because we already know all the positives. That's why you already projected to be the number one overall pick. But um, people like Ryan Clark, people like me, people who played the game before, we know how the game goes, right? So we should be able to read between the lines. And this is an interesting read by Ryan Clark on Caleb Williams. I didn't expect him to go here. We're all in protection of the fraternity, right? Ryan's a former player. I'm a former player. So we're going to protect the frat. But at the same time, we're going to keep it one thou wow too. Ah, sometimes it gets hard to do both. <laughs> in this situation, y'all just got to tell me what y'all thinking when y'all hear Ryan Clark talk about Caleb Williams in this way. I didn't expect this. Tell me what y'all think. If Caleb Williams isn't starting day one, and isn't it a highly successful NFL quarterback? It's the coach's fault and the organization's fault. I got to see Caleb Williams two times in person. And leaving the stadium, I said, the thing that they're going to try to use against him is that he doesn't play on time. You know why he didn't play on time, Greeny? Because he was better than everybody else. Because if he caught the snap and everybody ran and everybody was covered, you not only couldn't get him on the ground, but then he could throw it from anywhere he wanted to throw it on the field and put it in between the two numbers on the jersey of his receiver. I'm going to bring up three names right now. Oh, I mean this from the brother. bottom of my heart. Yeah. I'm going to start with Lamar Jackson. Mm -hmm. Immediately, once he's drafted, amongst quarterbacks that are in the NFL, Lamar Jackson is going to be the only one that scares you more with his legs. Ooh. That can move the pocket the way he can. Really? That can be elusive uh, in the yeah. backfield the way he can. Now, I'm going to bring up two other names. Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes. Immediately upon being drafted, when we're talking about arm talent, when we're talking about off-platform throws, when we're talking about being able to put the football anywhere you want to put it on the field, mm. that's the tier he's on. Mm. Now, you tell me this. <laughs> if you see a dude and those are the people you're comparing him to. You're going to say, we're going to draft him first overall because of all of those reasons. But you know what, dog? Don't trip. Sit down. I wish you would. You do that, that's going to be male practice. You should be fired. Your wife should never get a job. And your kids should be kicked out of school. <laughs> Man, okay. Y'all heard all that, right? That was a mouthful. That was an earful. Two ears. Uh, man, let's say this. Um... The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Never forget that. We know that, right? Sometimes you really are trying to do the right thing, the positive thing, the best thing, and it's just wrong. Um, Ryan Clark knows that there are too many variables for us to hear him declare that if Caleb Williams fails, it's because of the coaches and the organization. First, accountability comes into the conversation. What if Caleb Williams fails himself? What if Caleb Williams, not Caleb Williams, not good enough. Caleb Williams doesn't translate his talents on the field. You want to know why that is important? Because everybody knows that football is not an exclusive talent conversation. The game of football is a great game of skill and a greater game of will. So don't tell me how big, fast, strong you are and think I'm thinking you're amazing. I'm saying, oh, you set up for success. <laughs> you can be amazing. At the same time, those who are not the biggest, fastest, strongest still are set up for success. Obviously, it may be more difficult. I bring to you guys this. In football, who's the GOAT? Tom Brady. Biggest, fastest, strongest, best? I don't even know if Tom Brady's the best quarterback ever. He's the greatest. Give, who was the GOAT before him? Jerry Rice. Jerry Rice still may be the GOAT, obviously, of receivers, but Jerry Rice. 
goat. You even got a product, goat. You sent me some of this product before. Pretty good, too. <sighs> Biggest? Fastest? Strongest? No, no, no. It's not an exclusive talent conversation. Never has, never been. If so, ah, uh, all them labor, neighborhood legends, all them dudes that I grew up with, all them cats that were next level, Stace Bozeman's of, of the world, right? They would have made it. Stace should have stayed in football. Those Kuiper cats, every neighborhood in the world got somebody that we were like, dog, he insane. Al Jones out here in L.A. for those that know. Insane. Man child in high school. Did he make it? So, going pro is not an exclusive talent conversation. Best players don't always make it. The most professional players make it. And that is a Max Crosby. Max Crosby, what was he drafted? Uh, fourth round, something like that? Max Crosby. Had issues off the field, et cetera, substance abuse, all that. Cleaned his life up. Me and him had a conversation about this about a month or two ago. Cleaned his life up and went all in on this Mamba mentality, what meant to him doctors, physical therapy, sleep, water, working out, uh, elasticity, like really TB12 plan. And he did that. And look at Max Crosby. Max Crosby, look, he is a specimen. He is a beast, but he ain't the, he ain't the top dog. And so a conversation when you see somebody with tremendous talents, to say that they got to translate or it's everyone else's fault is not the way the game goes. It's also not the way we should be teaching it. It's not the way that kids should learn it. I wish my son, my son's a beast. Y'all know that. I wish my son would go to a team. And if it didn't work out for him, it's because of the team. It's because of the coach. Nah, fool. <laughs> hey, little man, get your reps up. Get your game up. You better look in that mirror, not out that window. So... The blame game and excuses are already starting. And you can't be serious. You can't think about it like that. Look, it's going to take a lot of people, the village, to make this thing work. Caleb Williams, top talent, going to probably one of the bottom teams, right? Unless there's the trade. That's why I said probably. It could be trading. You know how this is going, all this conversation. But he's going to go to a bad situation. That's where the top talent goes. It's still on you to be that top talent that translates not only in production on the field, but translates in changing the culture, the, the short-term culture of what the Chicago Bears may have right now, et cetera. You got to go in there and be so good that you bring those guys up and all of a sudden we start looking at each other in this place differently. C.J. Stroud just did it. You know, a lot of people weren't betting on him. I wasn't betting on C.J. Stroud to do all the things he did. I ain't know what to think. Oh, man, I don't know about that. Houston, look at him in the playoffs. So the point is, let's not go even, even in hot take, even in just conjecture, it's somebody else's fault. Y'all know how the game goes, man. Selfish and selfless has one thing in common, self. Right? So it's time to be a little selfish here, right? Get in there, Caleb. Show them how great you are. I believe in his talents. But if they don't work out, oh, it ain't all on no coaches. And it ain't all on no organization. So beat it up in the comments. Let me know what y'all think. Uh, you agree with Ryan Clark's take? Uh, how much of it do you agree with? Because I, I don't think it was a 0-100 take. I just think, like, come on, dog. We got to protect frat. But damn, dog, like that. Um, also, tell me what you think of Caleb Williams as a talent. I'm a and please don't give me the same thing everybody's saying. Oh, against the top teams, he didn't do anything. He didn't do everything that he was doing against the sorry teams because typically, I don't know sports. Let me see. You usually pad your stats against the sorry teams and then you look good against the good teams, right? You just you, you just go out there and, and match serve with the good team. Sometimes exceed expectations, do great. But you really get the numbers off the sorry teams. That's how the game goes. So, let me know what y'all think of Caleb Williams. Break it down. All right. And who's going to draft him and where is he going? Uh, let's get into this topic right here. How parents hmm, can just be cool. This was an interesting topic I saw. Uh, we have a man, Tim Hardaway Sr. Obviously, we know his son is a basketball player. Hardaway Jr. Um, I wanted to see what you guys thought about this one because this one really hits home for me. Uh, he's talking about that balancing act. You know us as parents. You see your kid, that's the thing you love the most in this world. Yep, more than they mama, more than they daddy. 
I don't even lie about that. I hate when people be like, oh, you know, honey. And that, that, I know it says we're supposed to do that in the Bible, but we know that everything ain't literal, right? <laughs> Come on, Bible. Come on, man. Like, if you have a kid and you have a wife, it, it, it can be a photo finish. I give you that. But it ain't no doubt who won the race. Your kid's going to win, man. That's how the game go. Uh, it produces more life. That's why. So I uh, want y'all to see this right here from Tim Hardaway and see what he's talking about. Let them grow up. and let Because same way with me. I used to talk to my son. He was... He looked at me. What's that? Yeah. I, I swear to God. I swear to God. This is how he looked at me. My, I'm tired of listening to you. And he just walked down the court. And I saw that look. I'm like, ooh. ooh. I was like, ooh. You know, you looked at me like you like you ready, You was ready to get down. And I never asked him that, but I, I that's how I felt. Well, put hands on you. Yeah, that's how I felt. Like he wanted to put hands on me. Yeah. And I was like, you know what? Let me let me just be cool. I'm gonna be cool. But it, that's that's what you, I think, and I tell all parents that: yeah. just be cool, calm down, remove yourself, and let them go out there and be them. And I guarantee you, they gonna have a lot more joy. Mm. They going to enjoy playing the game of basketball, and ha because they don't have to listen to you, they gotta listen to the coach. Yeah. They listen to their buddies. But they don't have to listen to you. You have to be mm. dad no matter what. Great point. Because when they come to you, you got to tell them the truth. And you got to make them understand this is what you're not doing. This is the way to do it. This is how you, you play defense. This is how you rebound, box out, whatever it is. Yeah. But let them come to that's you and real, ask you the questions. Real. Man, I love that. That's crazy. <laughs> he talking about little man looked at him like, bruh, bruh. <laughs> And that's the respect. That lets you know he was raised properly because he ain't going there. But he like, come on, man. You raised a beast. Let him out the cage. You know what I mean? I got this. I can roam out there and do it right. Oh, man. Uh, here's the thing about it. Because what I just heard was crazy. Like most parents, me included, if not all parents, can, I wish I could say all, but not all parents are involved. <sighs> Sometimes we act like things are life and death when they ain't life and death, right? Like you, you, you're, you're trying to discipline your kid. You're trying to rear your kid in the right direction, guide them. But we come in with that heavy hand because we know the consequences of if they continue that behavior. So we're talking from the consequences, but we're not talking from what they're doing in that moment. We're not talking from what they are trying to figure out. Because sometimes you did the same thing and nothing happened. But you are talking from the negative consequences of you keep doing that, this will go happen. But listen to yourself, mama, daddy. You did some of this, if not a lot of this, and not all of it turned out bad. But even if it did turn out bad, how do I know what's good if I don't know what bad is? How do I know what's bad if I don't know what good is? So it's always that balancing act. And that's the balancing act of teaching versus overreaching. And that's the problem. That's the tough part. Like, how much do you go into it teaching? And then how far do you go before you now? Oh, you're teaching, but now you're overreaching. You got to let them learn how to walk. How do you let them learn how to walk? You know how it was. When they first start standing up, right? Went from crawling to standing up, getting guided, getting supported by the armrest. <laughs> Y'all been rid of days? Same thing. It's, it's figurative. They, they they learning how to walk. And then how do they learn? They fall down bah, on their butt. Then first thing you say, oh, whoa, whoa, watch out for the watch out for the table. Then they get back up. They cry, go a little more. Oh, oh balance it back. Go back. That's how it has to happen. You got to support them. You got to guide them. You got to let them be in controlled environments as Jordan Jordan said, was it Jordan? Damn, I'm going to see him. Jordan Peters. Yeah. Uh, he said you got to have them in controlled environments of chaos. Yeah, Jordan Peterson said that. Controlled environments of chaos. That's dope. That's it. You got to like, all right, make sure they ain't going to die in this mother, but let them go and see how they go. <laughs> Little kids got to grow that way. Um, I'm really mindful of this, and I brought this up because I'm very involved with MJ, as you know. All my kids, but he's my oldest, so he has the most activities. He's the one that's playing basketball as Tim was talking about. And since I'm one of the coaches, but I'm also the 
the driver, the chauffeur to get them to practice, but also the one after practice to hear how it went. Also the one taking them to Baskin Robbins after the big game or after the player of the weeks and all. Like I'm hearing it all. And I got to make sure that I stay that soundboard that is not talking back too loud because then you tune them out. And there's been times where I'm looking at them in practice or sometimes I've seen them in the car and he's just like, Daddy, I don't want to be over consumed with this. Just upstairs, just upstairs before I came down here, um, he wanted to do his Minecraft. It's, uh, we're going on a camping trip. I said, all right, you can do your Minecraft after you do your educational. You always have to do an educational video or something in that realm before you get into your Minecraft. All right. And I said, do math. I said, do math right now. Let's do third grade math. He's in the second grade. He said, no, I want to do, uh, I want to do something worldly. I want to see the world. And then while I was walking away, I said, okay, that's educational. He said, yeah, because if I see the world on these videos and I know their culture, ah, when we, one day we could travel there and then I would know more. I will already know what's going on and I will learn more. That's it. Now, I, in that moment, I wanted him to do math. <laughs> I, just, I was like, uh, watch a video of uh, Indonesia. Like, go do some math. And then I was like, all right, that's what he wanted to do. So we got to make sure we're their support system. Right. Not always just the one pushing them, but the one that's catching them, too, when they fall. Oh, man. Uh, last thing about it is helicopter parenting. If you're a helicopter parent, raise your hand. And that's a compliment. I think helicopter parenting is not only a compliment, but the new way of parenting, because look, the way we grew up, that ain't how it went down. <laughs> Mom was like, all right, where are you going? All right. The street lights come on. Your ass better be back in this house. That was life. That was the sentence I heard a thousand times. Those street lights come back on your ass need to be back in this house. I don't know how old I was, but I was hearing ass. <laughs> my mother, my mother, and I made sure. And the weird thing is we didn't have like I, iPhones and iWatches. And all. I, I thought they came on at like 720. You know what I mean? But boy, if they came on at 719, you still outside. Lot, wah, wah. And that's a difference. But helicopter parenting, we're there now. My kids, first of all, my kids don't go outside. They go in the backyard. They don't go outside, like the front of the house and just chill out. Hey, they're young, but still, hey, it ain't that. I don't see kids just taking off, riding their bikes, making ramps in front of the streets, you know, on the streets and stuff. I don't see that. I just don't. It's a different animal. That doesn't mean these kids aren't active. That doesn't mean these kids aren't doing things. Look, to this point, people always say, these kids ain't doing nothing to sit around playing on their game, video games. Shut up. I just saw online this workout facility for like five-year-olds where they have five-year-olds learning how to run properly. Five years old. So y'all ain't counting that as like a kid being active. I've now seen online five-year-old kids working out. They have all type of resources and things we didn't even think about having when we were growing up. They have no damn workout center for no five-year-old. Your parents didn't even go to the gym. You know, they was in the garage. What up, homie? Nah, cuz I ain't doing you know what I mean? It's a different animal. So respect to the helicopter parents out there like me. It's a compliment. Take it like it is. It's just a change of times. We are around our kids way more than our parents were. But always remember being a helicopter parent, that kid still needs to learn how to fly for themselves. So make sure you're bouncing that out. Get that love in. So tell me what y'all thought about what he said. Your kids ever look at you like, you raised me better than to put these hands on you. Because I know my <laughs> MJ already gave me two of them looks, and that sucker going to be big. He's going to be bigger than me quick. So I better watch what I do, uh, not get into it too much. So respect to all you helicopter parents. Beat it up in the comments. Tell me what you thought from what Tim said and how difficult is it in that balancing act. All right, let's get to this one right here. Oh, man, this is a good one. Shannon Sharp was talking to Gilbert Arenas, and they were talking about respect. And how it's a two-way street. We all know that, but listen to how they broke that down. The number one currency in any hood is respect. Don't you take your ass in there all of a sudden, oh, I'm better than you because I got this. Some people gonna say, I don't give a F who you are. Don't run that through here. They know I'm out of place. Hell. But I give everybody respect. A lot of times people make the mistake, they think because of who they are and what they have, man, some of them ninjas, don't give a damn about that. Oh, no, they don't. That's why I walk away. You walk in there, I flip my pockets inside <laughs> out to show 
Zero dollar, <laughs> my number. Zero, I got nothing on me. Right. But when I was in, when I was in college, Gil, I was on the west side. I'm on 37th the Bull. I'm all over there. But <clears throat> I know how to conduct myself. It ain't all that. That hey, man, I'm man. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. <laughs> you coming out there? Think you better than? And, nah, bro. They hey, they chop you down. Get them their respect. I don't care what he does <clears throat> or who he is. Hey. I go to the barbershop, it's on the other side of town. I give people their respect, man. That's that's how you gotta conduct it. That's it. Okay, let's talk about that respect, R-E-S-P-E-C-T. First thing that jumped out to me for real, and I'm gonna dive deeper and then get to the shallow waters is, it's a damn shame that black culture, our culture, we always have to live in reference to this. Like, there's this equator, this line of demarcation between like black success and the hood. Like, you know, like, I always got to go back to the hood. Now, it's mainstream for us. It's probably, oh, I hope, I'm actually hoping it's the same for all different races, right? They like, Ugh. but you don't hear it, and I don't think it really is. Like, they always got to reference, they don't have to reference the hood. We have to reference the hood. I'm from the hood, and then it's like, oh, when I go back, you, you catching all this? Like, the navigation through the terrain of smooth paved roads and and success and ascension and the hood. And when you go back to the hood, this was crazy about it. And I'm not talking about them because I'm guilty of this because I know how it goes. You got to know these sets of rules, these conducts, codes of conducts. When you go back, you got to give them their respect. It sounds like you respecting them. You ain't respecting them. You scared for something to happen. So all you're going to do is just be like, you got it, big dog. Did you notice when Shannon was talking about the respect when he go back and on 37th Street or go back to the West Side? He was just like, mm -mm, no, no, you got it. You got it. Not even a real dialogue and conversation. Because when you go back, you're like, dog, your first thing is, man, I don't want nothing bad to happen. So then you like, all right, this dude ain't up to no good. This dude ain't up to no good. But the rest of these cats are cool. These are my homies or whatever. So what you do is when something looks like it's escalating, you know how it is, something getting a little off script. Oh, no, you got it, big dog. That ain't real respect. That's just like, please don't mess with me. Please let me get, I'm only here for two hours. Please let me just get in and out, get my cut. Let me go. Because real respect is this. Oh, we're going to engage in this conversation. We're going to talk through this, but you know not to do that because, one, he a knucklehead. <laughs> that ain't got nothing to do with the hood, just knucklehead. But, two, you ain't there on that mission. You there on the mission to get in and get out. I just think it's so damning to, like, because I used to be on the receiving side of that. Obviously, you grow up in Compton, you go up South Central. Somebody was coming back there saying, oh, I got about two hours, man. Be good to me. It's weird. I just thought that. So I could be overthinking it, but I don't think I am because I actually overlived it. Um, this whole like navigation of the hood and this respect. Now, the respect is let me get in and out the way I need to do it. Let's start here. Because I remember this conversation, the loudest I heard it was when I was in the league. I was playing for San Diego. Uh, about to go to Dallas, and I had a white Rolls Royce. I bring it up because I don't like the floss and flaunt. I'm just letting you know the real, because these are the dynamics. I had a white Rolls Royce, and I remember her buying it, and I was going to go see my grandma. Grandma still lived in Compton, never wanted to move, never wanted to leave, died in Compton, right? So I'm like, I'm going to see my grandma. Now, I got if I got a Rolls Royce, you know I got other cars, right? That ain't Rolls Royces. <laughs> so... I have options to pick something a little uh, less attention grabbing than a Rolls Royce, a little less flossy, right? But I ain't want to do that. Remember my earlier point about respect? Respect is really like a mutual thing. Respect is like, oh, no, we on the same level. Respect. Not, oh, you're not on my level, but I'm scared of what you're going to do to me, so I'm going to act like I respect you. So I was like, I'm literally in the garage like, don't draw the Rolls Royce. And everybody was like, don't draw that. Everybody, uh, that's what's echoing in my head. Don't draw that over there. And then I was like, then I was like, I was going to drive a BMW. I think that was like my normal day-to-day -day car time. And I was like, why would I do that? I'm from there. I know everybody there. Not everybody, but enough. <laughs> I, I could get in and out, but 
the real is, why would I do that? I almost felt like I was looking down on my people, looking down on my grandma, looking down on where I'm from. And more importantly, not letting them see me at my fullness, being proud of me and saying, damn, dog, that's how you doing it. And look, whether they were going to chase it or not, just to show them that we from this block can do this, just material. It ain't life. You know, it's just a version of success. Just one slice of success. I wanted to show them that. So you know what I did? I grabbed that Rolls Royce key. Angel popped up off the hood. Let's go. Now, can't lie. The whole way riding over there and all this stuff, I'm thinking in my head, like, because everybody done got to me already. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. I'm going, and I'm going dolo. Go to grandma's, park it out front. And as you know, everybody like, damn, damn. And then teddy bear here, teddy bear here. So then it went from looking at the car to like talking to me. What's up? I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just got this. They're like, damn, damn, damn. Let me see sitting and all that stuff. Right. Uh, love, love, love. And that felt good. But then I went back in the house. Nothing. No issues. Everybody was proud. Everybody was pumped to see me again. All this stuff. Leaving the crib. And I remember this moment like it happened yesterday. I'm at the red light. Once, what did Cube say? At the red light. Oh, man. I'm looking in the mirror so I can see who can see me. South Central done put Ice Cube to the test. It wasn't a dude in the SS, but it was a dude rolled up. And this is to Shannon's point. And he rolled up. And when he rolled up, he, he, he mad dog. He looking in the car tough. He rolled up and he looking like this. You got two choices. One, you can act like you don't see his ass, right? Stop it. Or two, you can look at him. Now, when you look at him, you got a lot of choices in that moment. But I look. So I'm there. I'm at the light. And I look at him. And I go like this. And he go like this. And you know what? That's what Shannon and them were talking about. The fact, one, that I look. Two, Eye contact at three, I see you. And he was like, I see you. Even if we see in different things, we see each other. And that's all it was. I swear, I don't know if it's true or false, but if I didn't look, I might have, it might have been a different story. I don't know. Then, why well, I know <laughs> something was going to happen. <laughs> then, like, like turn uh, green, he hit me real quick, throw it up, and gone. <laughs> Now, if y'all ever been to Rolls Royce, Rolls Royce would have got <laughs> Rolls Royce is a fast. Do not let that fat thing fool you. If they would have got, I just let him go. He wanted that moment. He wanted that. He wanted that win. He wanted that respect. So I saw that. I had to bring that story up, man. Um, beyond that, that respect is crazy because there were times where I would go over my grandma's house. Times where I go back to the neighborhood, and like my uncle, like one time, oh, this is bad. I'll give it to you quick. My uncle was like. Hey, let me see your keys, nephew. Let me see, see what you're rolling. I had an excursion at the time, for an excursion or something. I was like, all right. And I'm laying on grandma's floor, gave him the keys. He checking it out, checking it out. Either I took a nap or I woke up or just was like, damn, how long did it take you to check out my car? It ain't that big. And I remember going outside and it was gone. I took it all around. <laughs> it was gone. And this was... This might have been cell phone error, but he didn't have one or something like that. So I couldn't reach him. And I think my grandma was either paging or something. And she was like, he ain't picking up. He ain't, he ain't hitting back. And it took like hours, I think like two hours, then finally <laughs> he come back. And I was like, oh, where you go? Because I knew if my car didn't get stolen, I gave him the keys. I was like, what? And I was really mad. But I was like, this is still my uncle, kind of like we were talking about with a kid looking at his dad. I was like, I ain't about to flex on my uncle like that. But I was just like, oh, what, what, what? and he was like, oh, man, I, you were asleep. So I just, I was like, what I sleep? <laughs> I was like, what? She like, boy, my grandma went off on him. And I was like, where did you go? And he was like, nephew, come on, man. I was like, where you go? He was like. I had to go see a couple girls. <laughs> he went the floss. He went every girl he was dating to try and just pull up on him and just say, yeah, yeah, yeah. What y'all up to today? <laughs> I was like, I just chalked it up to the game. That was funny to me. My last point about this one is um, y'all know Big U, right? So I grew up, not when I was in Compton, my first six years and all that stuff, like when we moved off Slauson to his neighborhood. 
So I'm not going to go too deep into gang culture, but him and I did an interview before on NFL Network when I was working there. This is like 03, 04. Never aired. You want to know why it never aired? Because me and him was walking on Crenshaw just doing this interview. It was wild. Y'all know where the graffiti wall is, right? The mural wall, mural wall. And we were just walking there, and then we posted up there and started just talking real stories. <sighs> Too real. <laughs> Man, I'm not lying. When we finished and wrapped, I said, you. I don't know, dog. Like, damn. At first, I thought it was the most amazing interview ever. And because he was just him. And then I was like, on top of that, people ain't heard this before. And I was like, this is how I grew up. And then I was like, this is the big OG. And now I done brought it all together because I'm on TV. I was like, oh, man, I'm about to win me a Pulitzer. Forget an Emmy. I'm, <laughs> I'm about to get me one of them. Uh, they didn't air it. <laughs> it was just too graphic. I wonder for real where it is. That and that Drake, Kendrick Lamar beef. I need to find those in the annals. But um, i give you some highlights from what he said. He said, I remember one time he said, these athletes come in town, man. And these hyenas, you know, the young, the little Gs, you know, the babies, they 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 see the athletes. So imagine you at a club. It's a cat. He They ain't gangbanging like they used to. You know, ain't no penalty at all. They ain't looking like they in colors no more. They just regular old cats, button downs, chilling, right? He at the table with his girl. You know, he, he neighborhood star. He got the bad one, right? And then you come in, and everybody know who you are. You recognizable, all that. You got way too much money. You got you wearing too much money. You get to the best table. Everybody scoot over, and this is what happens. Those ushers and security guards and your homeboys and entourage, they come in, and they like bulls in China shop. They just, excuse, excuse me, They're like, we got to get to our table this fast. You know, y'all seen it. We all seen it. I've done it. And when you're doing that, watch who you bump. When you're doing that, watch who you're running over. When you're doing that, watch who you're scooting out the way. Now, you get there, and then you post up. First thing you do, you standing on the couch or something, or you just high, or you just looking around, or everybody clamoring around you, and you just looking, and then you see her. Now, you in the zone. You may even be sauced up. Whatever you're doing, you in the zone, and you looking at her. It's Adam and Eve stuff, right? So you just like, ooh, she bad. She with somebody, dog. <laughs> now, this your moment. This you at the red light. You can show, oh, you look, at the first thing you do whenever you see a fine girl, who with her? You see that dude, you probably don't respect him. If you don't respect him, you don't salute him, you don't give him his props, you don't just look away, whatever it may be. Ha, 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 check out this bizarre. He on it now. He ain't stupid because you ain't stupid. So don't play dumb, fool. <laughs> and now, next thing you know, you trying to, you try to sneak attack. You try to send homie over there, whatever it may be. Or he like, dog, he ain't he ain't understanding that he may be him, but we on the same level right here, right now. And this was the conversation we were having on camera. And so them young cats, a lot of times, not always by protocol, but a lot of times they call their big homies. They be like, hey, you know so-and-so? Because sometimes that could be somebody's cousin. I'll tell you this another time, so I ain't going to take forever. There were two times. They had to hit on me. And both times I got bailed out because they were they put the call in. They were like, no, nah, no, nah, that's wild. That's so-and-so cousin. That's so-and-so little brother. Like, you know, like I just know some cats and they knew me. So he was like, no, nah, not him. That's that's the homie. So they get that call. And if that call comes back like, I don't know him like that. No, nah, no, nah, that ain't nobody to us. And you, and you over there doing what you're doing? Gas. Me. Fire. <laughs> so we had a thousand of those conversations on air. It's crazy. I could go all in. And there's so many more. Y'all remember that era where athletes were just getting jacked? I mean, I'm sure it still happened a little bit here and there, but it was there was a time you couldn't go to no award show. You couldn't come to LA. As soon as they see your ass at Denny's or see you at Jerry's Deli or see you at uh, what was it, Cheesecake Factory or uh, uh, Grand Lux for real. You uh, you doing all that high sign and all that stuff? You ain't checked in to respect? Don't go to the bathroom. Um, or, let's be real. Sometimes it's just rando. Sometimes it's just not your day and it's going to be your turn. We know how the game goes. So, tons of those stories. Uh, remind me to tell y'all my Lexus story one time because, 
And you know I had to get you. They almost got your boy real bad right there. All right, so beat it up in the comments. Respect is two-way. I just think it's interesting. And I ain't want to focus in on the black culture. But, look, I ain't immersed in all the other cultures like that. But I just don't even hear it from the outside. Like, they got to navigate through so much just to go home. And when they say respect, like, we said respect. I'm saying respect, but I'm really saying I just really want to get in and out because respect is a little different. You don't do that when you're at home with your homies. When you're in your safer grounds and environments, it ain't sounding the same respect. Beat it up in the comments. Let's have some fun with this one and talk through the real from the fake. All right, y'all. Coming up next, I'll never shut up. Phone up some comments. Hit you with the wildism. That's next. Never shut up. Ranks TV and Reese TV. Back to Never Shut Up, it's your boy Marcel Spotty. Loving you guys. You know what I'm about. Positivity, man, and helping out the itty bitties. That's all. So make sure you support the itty bitties. Go to projecttransition.org. Leave a donation. Monthly donors, you get this book right here. All right, let's phone up some comments. Uh, let's talk about Steve Stout. I will listen to and body, but I think he meant anybody, but Steve Stout. Folks on the streets know what this guy represents. Shannon should know better. Them folks already calling him a sus. Hanging around this dude would only solidify solidify their claim. Well, he ain't hanging. Mm, he doing an interview with the guy. Like, this is the craziest thing about, what is it, Gator, Gator. Like, people trying to guess you gay. I, 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 every time I see a man trying to guess if another man's gay, I immediately think, why do you care so much? Guess. Now, if you just tell me you're gay, all right, tell me you're gay, and then let's talk through it. But if you're like, ah, well, look at that, look at that, look at that, look at that, look at that. Like when the Shannon video went viral, I was like, bad hips, bad knees, and walking, and, and, and the purse ain't helping, and just the hand gestures ain't helping. But I always stop short. And look, I am no better than y'all, no, <laughs> no more positive than y'all. I'm like, that looks gay. But then I know too many gay people that don't act gay. They act like you, me, we. <laughs> you ever go to Atlanta? Just to generalize it so y'all can get it. Ain't no acting gay all the time, right? It's just undercover. What do they call them? Undercovers? Undercover lovers or brothers or whatever the hell. Point being, come on, man. Like The, the whole gay guessing game is like, that's kind of young. Like, if he gay, he gay. But even if Shannon was gay, what's the problem? What's the point? Uh, what's his name? Andy Cohen gay. Now we know it. We ain't guessing, I guess, because he he's gay. That's an empire, bro. <laughs> like, I'm not trying to say any support or, or distant. I'm just saying the guessing. Like, let a person tell you who they are or not. And if not, mm, I just don't get this one. So hanging out with Steve Stout, I guess we're supposed to. Oh, Steve Stout's supposed to be gay, is what you're trying to say. And then Shannon is allegedly looking sus. So be careful hanging around him, because two susses make gay. <laughs> I hear you. I know what you're saying. But, man, why say it? Like, why even waste your time with that? All right, somebody says this. You should add a guest format. You are too thoughtful and insightful not to bring on interesting and complex people and ideas. Consider most nerdly as a guest. Look, I know that. I, I should be sitting right here with somebody else and whooping their ass and everything they say. Like, listening to them sound. I love that. Here's the thing. I love that. I'm better at that. 
I don't trust all of the co-hosts out there. So it has to be a certain person, right? A certain type. Very few that I really want to work with. And two, people are unreliable, man. You know what time it is right now? It is, I started this at six in the morning. All right. Then tomorrow I might do it at eight in the morning. All right. Then I might do it at four in the afternoon. That ain't for everybody, right? So uh, I get what you're saying. Uh, the content, look, I know I'll be way bigger and get more views and all that stuff. If I had somebody here and I'm beating them up and he'd be beating me up, we'd be talking that trash. And, and hopefully that works out. Um, but there's there's a lot more to that than just, oh, this great content. It's like, yeah, is it great logistically? Remember, I have four kids. I have a wife who's on TV. I got a foundation, uh, owner in a network. They got to make sense to <laughs> make dollars and make sense, right? So let's get that stuff. Um, let's talk about those athletes right there. It's got to be rough being a good to great paid athlete. The sacrifices made, discipline applied, and the relationships lost to get to the top must take its toll. And one day the career will be over. It's very possible that the athlete never focused on anything else. So when it's over, everything seems over, especially if that career was cut away short and or unfulfilled. Yep, it is tough. I mean, it's a death. Like when you're done playing, it's a death. But here's the thing. I'm not letting these athletes get a pass. Yo ass was in class. Everybody else goes to school, majors in something, literally leaves school, goes into the real world and does a job that most of the time ain't even with that major. They adjust. They deal with it. How come the athlete gets this pass of, oh, all I was doing was ball, so I'm sorry. I'm 30-something or 20-something and forgot that there's other things I can't do or should have done. Y'all got to stop raising these dudes like that. It ain't happening in my house, and it ain't happening in a lot of houses. Like, a lot of people are like this. I hate when it's like, oh, all athletes are raised to be athletes and nothing. No, they're not. They just choose to do that. You know how long you in class. Oh, no, I just knew I had to play ball. I have, there are schools now, these, I forget the name of them, where now you only go to like three or four classes and the rest is, is ball. I've seen them. My boy went to one. Point being, stop letting it go like that. That's on the parents, man. Like, tell them, I know too many people that are smart. Amal St. Brown, like that whole family. Like, come on now. Like, let's stop this. Cats that go to Stanford and ball out too. Like, let's stop this. The whole athlete. To be great, you got to just do nothing but sports. Um, last one. Uh, oh, this is interesting. Sometimes being forced out will force you to start your own, whether you leave a job or position. Always think about starting your own instead of getting another job or position. Yeah. Um, look, that's going to be our wildism. That's all I'm going to say right there. I'm going to talk about that one. I got I to gotta skip that one. Uh, last one about Skip Bayless. We rocking with Skip. I feel like this guy doesn't even watch Undisputed or First Take. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Skip's legacy, obviously, impact. Obviously, uh, Mr. Embrace Debate. Um, Godfather in that respect. But also, um, the formula, people are going to say, dude, because I know Skip. So Skip is really a nice person. Uh, a little more quiet than what you see on air. A little... Um, just more gentle, just a great dude. And then you see on air that guy who went at all these athletes and allowed, like, really the lexicon or allowed uh, a lot of the rhetoric to shift on athletes and sports media and sports culture. So you got to blame him for that. At the same time, give him his props for how well he did it, right? So it's kind of like, ooh, it's Skip Bayless. Um, I don't think his, his legacy is bad. I just think that it's going to be it's going to be balanced. It's going to be conflicted. It's going to say great things, but boy, that wasn't necessarily a great dividend in terms of how athletes are now being treated. All of that. All right, let's get into this because I got to answer that question with my Wiley-ism. Yeah. Necessity is the mother of invention. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Necessity is the mother of invention. You just ask me, like, when people get forced out, et cetera. Like, everybody knows, like, <clears throat> when Shannon left Undisputed, like, Shannon didn't raise his hand to leave Undisputed. The bosses and him came to a conversation like, hey, this ain't working. And look, if Skip wanted him to stay, he would have stayed from the boss's perspective because Skip is the one that gave him the opportunity in the beginning. And remember they had them contract negotiations, go back in time, look at it, Shannon and the race card and Shannon not getting paid as much and all that. Skip had to really co-sign on all those things or it doesn't work like that. And, and power to Skip. But guess what? 
that ain't a racial thing. That's not because they're they're show Stephen A. Howard and Stephen A. He a black guy who got to sign off on you or you ain't coming on first take like that. Come on, man. We know the game. So it's not any of that. It's when Shannon was faced with that reality, you you reinvent yourself. So mother is the necessity of invention for products. We get it. We need this. We got to make this up. Let's go get it. And they make up that new product. But it's also for people. Right. And you redefine who you are. You reinvent who you are. And sometimes that comes out of necessity. It's the rare a person who is sitting there like, man, I really want to do that. I should do that. Right. So I give it to you raw and personal. When when Fox, our first conversation was, Marcellus, what do you want to do next deal? And I said, more. And I, I, usually when you say more and the person's rocking with you, they're excited. When I said more, they got reserved. They were like, more? More in what way? And I was like, I wanted to go deeper. I wanted to go harder. I wanted to take on tougher topics. Knowing that the industry was shifting to hot takes, like, like literally shifting. Because before it was like hot take, hot take, real analysis. Now it's just like hot take. Like, And I, I knew it, and I wasn't built for it, but I was like, I'm going to milk this thing. We're going to go deep. We're going to be like Brian Gumbel up in here. <laughs> like we going, you know what I'm saying? I was like, we're going to do real sports up in here. And all those political topics, all the racial topics, all the, all the social dynamics that was creeping into sports. I was like, we're doing it. And they were like, nah, we're going to do this show with four people. We all going to give everybody passing the rock. And it's going to be hot potato, hot takes. Uh, I already went through Sports Nation. And so, like, Sports Nation was a different thing. It was a lighter show, but it. It checked that box for me where it's like, let's stay on the surface, keep it light, keep it fun. And that's the word they use. And that's what got me. Um, but we're going to, Marcellus, we want a lighter show. I was like, ah! And that was what Sports Nation was. And that's what we did, lighter. And I was like, damn, I'm going back in time. I'm like, I'm not, I'm almost 50. And now I'm doing a show I did when I was almost 40. Oh, that's interesting. All right. Who am I to give up all, all these millions, right? <laughs> So tried to work through that conversation, et cetera, et cetera. And going through the negotiation conversation, my contract was up in June. Uh, they kept me on the payroll, July, nothing, August, nothing, September. We start talking about, uh, we were doing first things first conversations. We were talking about podcasts and then putting it on TV conversations, everything. But y'all been a part of a team before? Y'all ever been in a situation before where you know, and I used to say it better than this, but there's a there's a time when you're somewhere and you're doing things and people are doing it with you. And there's times when people are doing things because that's what they want to do as well. So support looks different than when you're doing something or when we're doing something like a relationship. You could be together, but. You know when y'all rocking with each other versus uh, y'all just together, but y'all doing separate things. And I just felt that I wasn't going to get properly supported. And I didn't feel like they really believed in what I wanted to do. And frankly, what I wanted to do, nobody, <laughs> nobody was trying to do. So I'm like, man, well, we can make this stuff positive and deeper and more fun. Like, we can do all that. It just doesn't have to be lighter. It doesn't have to be pandering. It doesn't know. So long story short, um, I had to reinvent not only what I wanted to do, but how I was going to do it. And that's what led to me and the foundation popping up front and center instead of just being a part. I wanted it to be front and center. Right. And then that's also what led to me getting ownership from John Brinkus and Pep Brinks. Simple as that. Um, but I had to reinvent myself. Shannon reinvented himself. And I love that. Um, countless others. You may have to as well. Reinvent yourself, right? It's not just a product because mother, 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 mother of invention. You know where that comes from. Necessity. So the key is don't need to do that, right? The key is to don't not need to do that. Um, the key is to actually always keep that in mind and want to do that and not be forced out in that mode. But either way it goes, man, never forget it. It's okay. It's not just products. Necessity is the mother of invention. That'll do it for today's episode. Never shut up. Love you guys. Have fun. 
Have a ball. Have a great weekend. I'm going camping. Pray for me. <laughs> and the wolves. I wish one of them wolves would. I, I beat up a, a wolf. I got a wolf. Wolves. Mm, night night. <laughs> Love you guys. Have an amazing weekend. <laughs>